Thank you. It's a great pleasure to come back to Keto Fest. This is a wonderful community and really a unique, special event. And I'm very happy to be here. So, just in brief, in case you haven't heard of what a carnivorous diet is, and I will definitely go into more detail in a little while, the basic idea is that your diet is composed only of animal-sourced foods. You eat little to no plants. And while it is almost always ketogenic, at least mildly, as a side effect, that isn't the primary goal. Well, we know at this point a lot about the health effects of low-carb diets. Some diseases are unambiguously better treated with a ketogenic diet than any other known treatment, including drugs or surgery. And epilepsy and type 2 diabetes are now counted among those. And besides that, there are countless conditions that people are reporting again and again that are, they're seeing benefit in, particularly anything to do or related to a metabolic syndrome. Um, there are others that are being tested while we speak. So why would someone who could be on a diet that's already got a lot of evidence for it and is already restricted further restrict their diet in a way that was not required for any of these results that we have gotten in the medical literature? Moreover, as time goes on, many ketogenic advocates are actually emphasizing vegetables in a way that we didn't before. And uh, I, I would like to say that the evidence for vegetables isn't really any more um, better based than the evidence against saturated fats, but nonetheless, we have been em emphasizing them in the community. Well, the reason is that it has to do with personal experience. Hundreds of people, if not more, <laughs> are reporting that a plant-free diet has been resolving symptoms of chronic diseases that have been considered incurable, including autoimmune diseases such as arthritis and asthma, mood disorders like bipolar, depression, anxiety, um, and severe digestive disorder disorders like ulcerative colitis and IBS. It may be the case, actually, that all of these have an autoimmune component. That's certainly the opinion of uh, the doctors at Paleo Medicina in Hungary, Zofia Clemens and Shabatov. Um, and we'll talk a little bit more about that later. So what makes a carnivorous diet different? Is it just a matter of a very low carb? Actually, no. It's clarifying to, con to use the question of what makes your diet what it is, and we'll see that the it, carnivorous and ketogenic diets have very different bases. How do you know if your diet is ketogenic? Well, it's ketogenic simply if it produces ketones. If you're in ketosis, then your diet is ketogenic. Now, there are different things that contribute to how, how much ketosis you're in. Macronutrients is certainly the big one. But as we've talked about before, aerobic activity can increase ketosis. And you can uh, be in deeper ketosis just by adding uh, fat or ketone supplements themselves. The biggest factor, though, is macronutrients. And this graphic uh, isn't meant to be a demonstration of a linear relationship, but simply to demonstrate that you need to lower both carbohydrate and protein ultimately to be ketogenic, but carbohydrates are definitely more important to lower than protein. Um, I think this point has been underemphasized. If you think about a carbohydrate-free diet, if I'm on a diet that's where I know that I've figured out through self-experimentation that I can eat 25 grams of carbohydrate and stay in ketosis. I'm still probably getting my, maybe, I hope, getting my minimum amount of protein. If I take away those 25 grams of carbohydrate, that gives me a lot more leeway in protein before it's going to disrupt ketosis in a way that I don't think people realize. The thing about a ketogenic diet is that it's micronutrient and anti-nutrient agnostic. You can do a ketogenic diet that's plant-based, and if you really uh, have strong personal reasons for doing a vegan diet, then I still think that it would be better to do a low-carbohydrate one than not. 
So you could be getting your fat from nuts and seed oils and fruit oils like avocado. You get proteins from legumes. You may have some small intake of carbohydrate from grain and starches. Besides that, you will probably be getting a lot of extra fiber and you'll be getting a lot of anti-nutrients. And the problem that you could run into is that those anti-nutrients can be inflammatory and, and can induce deficiencies. You could do a ketogenic diet by asceticism. You minimize all your macronutrients and you're going to become ketogenic. You maximize your fasting, you exercise a lot, and of course the obvious potential problem with this is that you could suffer from mal malnutrition and compromised lean tissue. And you can do a ketogenic diet by supplement. So no matter what you're eating, if you're adding enough MCT oil or ketone esters, like Amy Berger was just saying, you will get ketones into, into circulation, and that can be very therapeutic. However, we don't really know what the potential problems of that would be in the long term. If you've got high glucose and high ketones, that looks a little bit uncomfortably like ketoacidosis to me, and I don't know what would that, that would look like in the long term. The reason why people usually take up a ketogenic diet is for the suspected or known benefits, such as fat loss is probably the most common one, and we uh, want to see d disease remission in epilepsy, metabolic diseases, cognitive decline. There are many others. People are using this as an adjunct for cancer therapy. Um, many reasons why you, why you might try a ketogenic diet based on things that you've read. Um, but one interesting thing about that is that ketosis itself doesn't perfectly correlate with the outcomes. It's, it's not linear. So one reason for that is that your blood levels may not reflect exactly your oxidation. Uh, you could have diminishing returns. I'm sure there are. Nutritional ketosis is reached maybe at about 0 0.5 millimoles, and you don't get the same extra amount of benefit. There's no bonus for going up to 10, <laughs> let alone 11. Um, and some of the benefit may come from lower glucose levels. They may come from uh, the circulation of more fatty acids. There's adenosine. There are all kinds of all kinds of uh, mechanisms that go on when you go on a ketogenic diet that could be part of the therapeutic benefit. It's not all ketones. This is a quote from Charles Goodhart. It's a little bit obscure. He said, any observed statistical regularity will tend to collapse once pressure is placed upon it for control purposes. This is the basis of Goodhart's law. And Marilyn Stradhorn expressed it a little bit more easily to, to understand. She said, when a measure becomes a target, it ceases to be a good measure. And so you see the problem here. Scientists have put people and other animals on a variety of interventions that result in ketosis, and they also have good outcomes, the ones that we really want. And the ketosis is reliably linked to the outcome. And then we use ketosis as the new goal. So people who want those outcomes believe that all they have to do is achieve a certain level of beta-hydroxybutyrate and they'll get the outcome that they want. So we're chasing ketones and forgetting about what the actual health outcome that we want. Ketosis is a marker of a very powerful metabolic state, and I don't deny that at all, but it's not necessarily a marker of nutritional status or any other dietary characteristic. So let's contrast this with a carnivorous diet. How do you know if your diet is carnivorous? Well, in contrast to a ketogenic diet, um, apologize for the graphic there, <laughs> a, car a carnivorous diet is you know that you're on one because of what you're actually eating. So like with the case with the ketogenic diet, there are different things that um, could contribute to how, how carnivorous your diet is. Obviously, the more plant foods you're eating, the less carnivorous you would consider your diet. There's some controversy over whether you're going to include plant extracts, such as uh, infusions or like tea or coffee or spices, and whether you're, if you're taking a drug that's been derived from a plant, does, does that mean you're less carnivorous? Not necessarily, uh, but it could have an impact on your health. Unlike a ketogenic diet, while carnivory, there's still many different me menus which would qualify as plant-free. But 
there are certain qualities that are just much more likely to be true once you know that diet is based on meat. Even the worst carnivorous diets that you can imagine are probably covering all your amino acids. They're probably covering at least most of the micronutrients that you need. They're going to absolutely reduce the anti-nutrients in your diet, and they're very likely to be ketogenic. And if they're not right away, you could make it more so without compromising the plant versus animal aspect of it. So it doesn't mean they're all equivalent, though. If you just take the diet that you grew up on, which may have been great or it might not have been, <laughs> um, and you just take away all the plant matter, you might have a very limited diet. It's, it, it's probably all land livestock or mostly. It probably didn't include organs or bones. It may not be high in fat at all. And if, so if you're, if you're not making some sort of change, then it's likely that you will have insufficient fat or energy intake, and you could possibly have deficiencies as well. If you take a more traditional diet that you might have find in um, well, a couple generations further back or in Europe or Asia, you're much more likely to be getting a variety of animal sources, including seafood and organs and bones and higher in fat. And I don't know of any reason to think that this would be unhealthy. The goals in carnivory are, some of them are similar to ketogenic diets. Fat loss is definitely a big draw. That's why I was originally drawn to it. But the diseases that tend to go into remission that are drawing people now, after, you know, it's come as a surprise, are ones, again, that I've already mentioned, the digestive, autoimmune, and mood disorders. And so I think that um, people now that are hearing about carnivorous diets are people who uh, have those conditions and are hoping to get some relief. Plus, of course, you get in for free many of the benefits of a ketogenic diet. It's typically mildly to moderately ketogenic, and if it's not and you want that, you can adjust it, and if uh, lots of people are actually getting benefit when they're not seeing high ketosis, which is very interesting to me. So the zero-carb diet is the diet that I was introduced to in 2009 when I first started. And it's still, this community is still going very strong today, and I want to talk about it because many of the carnivores that you'll meet, this is the diet that they're following. They have these rules. Eat only from the animal kingdom, drink water. There are some allowances for people. I mean, it's not, it's not like you're going to be kicked out of carnivore club if you don't follow the rules, but the encouragement is to drink water. Um, forget about eating organs. We're, we're doing fine on steak. Um, do prefer fatty meat because that's better satiety and you don't want to get rabbit starvation, but you don't have to target ratios. You don't have to try to get 80% fat. And in fact, many people will say ketones are actually irrelevant. Don't worry about it. Don't measure it. And they say always eat to satiety, never fast or restrict calories. Now, all of these have reasons. Um, some of them I agree with more than others, but I can definitely understand the motivation for all of these uh, rules. So I want to tell you about a survey that I took earlier this year from Zero Carb adherers. The purpose of it was specifically to compare experiences of Zero Carb compared to very low carb and to distinguish that from just anecdotes of what happened to me when I went on a carnivorous diet, because we don't know um, if they would have had those equal benefits when they went on a very low-carb diet. This is very limited, and I'm only giving it to you as a kind of smattering of our anecdotes. There's no real no numerical uh, conclusion that we can draw from it. For one thing, it's highly self-selected. These are all people who were on forums and who are willing to participate. There's huge survivorship bias. All the people who went on a carnivorous diet and said, oh, that's not helping me, are not in my survey. It's a very small sample size. I had an unfortunate problem uh, with the software I used. I had over 100 people respond, and I was only able to use about a third of the data because of a glitch on the mobile app. And because I come from a cypherpunk background, I, had, I care more than I probably should about people's privacy, and I never linked anybody's email addresses to their data, so I couldn't contact the people and say, well, you... I could have contacted everybody, but I, I didn't. Um, and also, finally, uh, there are clusters of symptoms. If somebody says, I had anxiety disorder, and then, then I didn't, um, we're going by their assessment of that, which it may be fine, but it, 
it's, it also can have problems. So I had 36 people, and this was their distribution of the time that they were on a zero-carb diet. So a good third of them were relative newcomers, only a month to six months. Oh, by the way, everyone who was on this had to have been on a very low-carb diet for at least six months. So it couldn't have been, you know, I just, I started a very, a very low-carb diet, and then I immediately went on to a carnivorous diet. And then uh, up to the, there's a small proportion of people who were five to ten years or ten more than ten years. The most, one of the most striking things that I have found just self-reported in the zero carb community is an improvement in cognition and energy and mood and sleep. And so these were ratings, zero, that's six ratings, zero to five of how good your mood was when you were on a low carb diet and when you were on a carnivorous diet. And I think it's, it's pretty typical of representative of what I see in groups that everyone um, or most people that I hear from have these very, it's a very big shift to the right, especially if you look at that mood and outlook one, the bottom two categories aren't, aren't even, don't even show up once you go into a carnivorous diet. Huge, uh, almost everybody's in the five for mood and similar with the others. What about changes in disease symptoms that were present on low carb? So the next few graphics I'm going to show you are all, that I only counted them at all if someone is still experiencing symptoms of the disease while they're on a very low carb diet. And for all those people, I, I'm showing in the graph whether um, that resolved or improved or stayed the same or got worse. So psychiatric first. So for example, this shows that there were 16 people who were depressed while they were on a very low carb diet. Uh, six of them went, it completely resolved. Nine of them it improved, but didn't completely resolve, and one stayed the same. Um, I, since, I don't think the, the number, the numbers are too small to get a, a very generalizable picture. I think I've, um, I've heard anxiety improvement even more than I've heard depression improvement. Um, but that's just my impression from talking to people. Another thing that's very commonly uh, reported as improved going to a carnivorous diet is skin. And I asked a whole uh, a gamut of skin conditions that are very disparate from one another. And it was, um, you can see that everybody who had some kind of skin condition before they started, before they went onto a carnivorous diet, I think at least half of them completely resolved, and whether it was rosacea or herpes, including cold sores or psoriasis or just dryness, um, one person had uh, worsening acne, um, but I think generally it's an improved picture. Here are the traditional autoimmune d uh, diseases. A large uh, number of people were still suffering from arthritis on a very low-carb diet that had great improvement, for example and some others as well. I, I put fibromyalgia in parentheses because I didn't actually ask that question, but two people brought it up of their own accord, so I stuck it in there in this picture. And the thing that it seems to improve the most is digestion. So I think it's really striking that almost every person who was in this survey was still suffering from blo bloating and gas while on a very low-carb diet. And what, two-thirds of them, it completely went away. Um, not surprising to me, actually, uh, based on what I've heard, but um, nonetheless, when you see it like that, it, it's still striking. And then finally, the insulin resistance markers that I asked about. Um, the, the really interesting one is excess weight, of course, because there's a significant number of people in this group that actually gained weight when they went from a very low-carb diet to a carnivorous diet. I have two speculations about that. One is that people who are, have been calorie-restricted for a very long time are often drawn to this diet because one of the things that it promises, in a way, is that um, you can lose weight while eating as much as you want, and for many people that's the first time they've ever heard that. And I think that 
Um, we know that some people who have been on semi-starvation diets for a long period get a higher set point and gain weight, and we don't really know why, and that might be a contributing factor. Uh, another factor, of course, could just be that it's not ketogenic, and maybe they need that ketogenic control to get their insulin down and get their weight under control. Um, but the really striking thing about that to me is that I don't, I don't remember if, I didn't check if these people who gained weight were more the newcomers or the longer term people. But imagine staying on a diet that caused you to gain weight compared to your previous diet. That means that the benefits that you got must have been considerable. A hypoglycemia, which would be the, you know, the more traditional marker of insulin resistance, did get a lot of resolution. Uh, it's too bad we couldn't measure insulin itself. Well, not everything improves and not everything is easy when you go on to a carnivorous diet. A, an immediate punishment, like a digestive issue, can be really motivating, and a reward, like better sleep or better mood, can motivate your adherence. But discomfort is going to compromise your ability to continue, and I think the two biggest problems when you're on a diet is feeling satisfied with what you're left to eat and um, not constantly desiring something that's off your diet, and social discomfort. So um, some things that I think interfere with appetite and can lead to dissatisfaction with what you're eating are things that that you eat even when you're not hungry. <laughs> so things that taste sweet, things that taste spicy. Um, and I put opioids with a question mark because I know there's been some research showing that certain things like dairy products, which granted are on carnivorous diets, um, can be contributing to addictive-like behavior. Uh, it's not something I know a lot about. Uh, but here is how that came out. People rated um, the how much they were having cravings or obsessive thoughts of food while they were on a very low-carb diet to while they were on a carnivorous diet. This one's really striking because the whole three top categories disappear on the carnivorous diet, where it was kind of heavily weighted toward the last three in the low-carb diet. I, had, I talked to one person who left uh, sweeteners in her diet. She was completely carnivorous except for that, and... Uh, after she went off that, she wrote to me and said, I can't believe I waited so long to do this. The difference is just enormous. <laughs> uh, the other thing is social discomfort. And there are many kinds of social discomfort, and we experience that just in the keto world. So there's not fitting in. Um, with, when you're eating a ketogenic diet, you can kind of fill your plate with vegetables, and if you didn't put the pasta or rice or bread on your plate, maybe no one will notice, but it's a lot hard for people not to notice when there isn't a single vegetable on your plate. They're saying no to gifts of food or celebrating your aunt makes your favorite pie, or you know, you kind of look like a party pooper. There's not wanting to explain every time you sit down to eat why this diet isn't killing you. <laughs> and there's no privacy because so many social events have food incorporated into them. I recently went to a party and when food inevitably came up and I explained to the person how I ate, she, she literally said, you are the craziest person I've ever met. And, you know, I... I don't really mind at this point. Uh, sometimes I actually enjoy being a bit of an iconoclast. But if that had been a work interview, for example, it might have been a little bit um, more uncomfortable. So uh, social discomfort does come out significantly worse, even for these self-selected survivorship adherers. Well, OK, so what? <laughs> Can we conclude on the basis of these reports that most people who try carnivorous diets are going to experience all of these benefits? Absolutely not. I would never suggest that. Uh, the, we just don't have the right kind of data yet. Um, if all you know is that 100 people told you that on a carnivore diet their arthritis went into remission, you really wouldn't know very much. You wouldn't know if this was coincidence. Uh, you don't have the ability to even see the rate, uh, how many people did it help versus how many people it didn't. Except there's one important fact, and that's that autoimmune diseases and mood disorders are considered incurable. 
So the fact is that there's some 54 million people with arthritis, and it's considered incurable. There may be some people who are silently putting their arthritis into remission, but they don't seem to be talking about it. And if they did, I, I don't think it's going to be a huge percentage number compared to that 54 million. Um, so how many people would have to, who had arthritis, would have to try a carnivorous diet and fail to get that 100 to look like it's pretty random? I, I think even if you had a thousand people with arthritis who tried a carnivorous diet and only a hundred of them got complete remission, that's a really significant result compared to where we're at. The bottom line from this, of course, is that we really do need studies to find out if, if this is really significant and what is going on. Um, but what do we need a study for? Um, we need studies to determine the efficacy and the mechanisms, if it gets that far and we, there is efficacy, and to try to guide people to what therapies are actually worth putting their limited time and resources into. But for an individual, for you, if you have arthritis, you don't need a study. If the main cost of trying a carnivorous diet is social discomfort, and you try it for a month, and it doesn't work, you haven't really lost anything. But if it does work, the benefits are incalculable. So is it worth it to try it, though? That's one thing that a study can tell you, is whether, whether this is just nonsense or whether uh, there's something really you should be looking at. Uh, do we have anything besides this growing pile of anecdotes, one-sided, you might say, anecdotes, in which to base an idea that this could be helpful? Well, we could talk about fiber and how people with existing digestive disorders have in some cases been shown to get complete relief from zero fiber diets. We could talk about plant oils. This community does talk about the dangers, especially of getting too much of this particular omega-6 fatty acid. If you're eating a lot of commercial salad dressings and cooking oils, then maybe removing those alone could be making a difference. Low starch plants are often full of anti-nutrients. And that means sometimes you can improve just the nutritional quality of your diet by removing plants. Ironically, some of these plants are considered nutrient-dense, but their value is actually subtractive. I don't have time today to talk about all of these, but for example, phytates block mineral absorption, sometimes quite drastically. Protease inhibitors are blocking protein. Um, Saponins can block the absorption of fatty acids and, and the nutrients that go along with those. Lectins disrupt the gut barrier, and I'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. But among the low-carb plant foods, nightshades are the ones that get the most recognition in the paleo community, particularly in the context of autoimmune disease. That's probably because of the influence of Lauren Cordain, who was one of the founders of the paleo movement, and he's written about nightshades and some mechanisms that he and others believe are fundamental to autoimmune disease processes, namely that certain compounds common to nightshade plants increase the permeability of the intestines, sometimes called leaky gut. Uh, just at a high level, what is intestinal permeability? Well, you have uh, cells that are adjacent, just like a cell itself has uh, ways to let certain things in and certain things not keep them out. The intestinal barrier, barrier is uh, cells that are adjacent to each other who, that have tight junctions that have the ability to let nutrients pass, but to keep all these other things that are passing through your body out. Um, tight junctions can actually be compromised by some plant substances, as well as other things. And when that happens, foreign bacteria are going to get into your bloodstream, and they're going to cause an immune, immune response. But unfortunately, food proteins are also going to go into your bloodstream, and they can create an immune response and inflammation. And then um, further, once you've had that immune response, if you've had it enough times, and I don't know exactly how the thresholding will work, but if you see that dendritic cell, it's actually got a feeler out into the intestines. And if you've already amounted an immune response to something that 
would be safe just to be in the inside the intestines, but isn't safe in the bloodstream. Now it's out there detecting it in a place that it should be safe, and it can set off the immune response uh, even when it hasn't gotten into the bloodstream. And then this kind of inflammation can get into joints, it can get into the pancreas, it can get into the thyroid, and this is considered, at least theoretically, to be a possible basis for autoimmune diseases. Certain compounds found in nightshades, like capsaicinoids, can trigger tri tight junctions to open, and that's why they're avoided on these autoimmune paleo diets. But this explanation makes it clear why certain seemingly negligible, negligible things like spices can negate the effects of a diet. It's not an extremism in this case to emit spices because it's not about the carbs. But if the intestinal permeability theory of autoimmune disease is correct, then it's no wonder that protocols that simply emit nightshades um, are of marginal effectiveness because many of the other plant compounds that I've already mentioned can have effects on the intestinal barrier, including certain fibers, plant oils, and uh, lectins and saponins, probably more of them. Tight junctions are important in many groups of cells. There's even a hypothesis that once you've had this compromise in the intestinal burial, barrier and you have uh, these particles floating around in the bloodstream, that they can similarly affect another barrier, which is the blood-brain barrier, and then uh, that could be a cause of inflammation and immune response in the brain as well. Tight junctions are important in cancer. Um, when a tumor cell detaches in order to travel, that uh, can be because the adhesion was not properly uh, tight and uh, the ability of it to pass into the bloodstream and then out again into another area in metastasis is in part a tight junction problem. And it may explain why some cancers, such as lymphoma, are associated with autoimmune disease. Now, I don't want to overstep the evidence, um, just as in, a, in the low-carb research, we know that there were indigenous societies who ate a higher proportion of carbohydrates and they didn't have diabetes and obesity. And so it would, it would be negligent to say that carbohydrates are the sole cause of these diseases. There has to be something else going on. But on the other hand, if you are insulin resistant and a diabetic, low carb is absolutely the best therapy. And, and there's no question that you should be on a low-carb diet in that situation. Well, similarly, we know that there are many indigenous societies that didn't have autoimmune diseases or psychiatric diseases or digestive diseases, and they ate plants. So plants alone are probably not the cause of these diseases. But on the other hand, if you already have a system that's compromised in this way, it's possible, and I would, I would guess, probable that a plant-free diet could help you a lot. So, in summary, people are reporting improvement and remission of incurable diseases on carnivorous diets, and I think we should pay attention to that. We need studies to find out if this is actually generalizable, but individuals can also test themselves, and it's, it's not a difficult, costly, or risky thing to do. Carnivorous diets have a more uniformly high-quality nutrition than ketogenic diets, in, unless you're very careful about that, and they're usually ketogenic as a bonus. Plant products have a variety of potential ways that could disrupt your health. Intestinal permeability is already implicated in autoimmune disorders, and it could be the key to understanding the basis of these observations, and if so, it explains why a merely low plant diet doesn't have the same effect because it's more qualitative of a sensory system than a quantitative effect. Thank you.